Hi, this is Scott Bradfield, and this is uh, a week 40 or 43rd episode of reading, reading Great Books in the Bathtub. And we're going to ask the perennial question this week, or the never asked question uh, Is Ulipo, uh, uh, Ulipian fiction, good bath time reading, or can we compose? Where's my other book here? Can we compose Ulipo? Oh, here's what I want Ulipo in the bathtub. Now, I don't want to spend a long time. I'm going to talk about when I'm a writer who I've always enjoyed. I can't say he's my favorite writer, but he's a writer I, I enjoy named Harry Matthews. This is his first book, The Conversions. It came out in, oh, what is this, 1961? 62. It was a few previous uh, excerpts have been published in places. And he was a fairly, I get the feeling he might have been a fairly well off kid. Lived in Paris with a lot of the, 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 the 60s expats, you know, the kind of the Ashburys and the, and the Plimptons and the, the people who had a bit of money, I think. And um, he was a good writer. He was a funny writer. He got involved with a group called Ulipo. I can't remember how that goes. I think it's, it's Ouvrier. Ouvrier Literature Potentiale, the, the, the Workshop of Potential Literature. That's what Ulipo means in French, the original French term. You'll see the term Po in there, and they were very fond of Edgar Allan Poe, and they were particularly fond of any of the gamesmanship of Poe. So the anagrams and the puzzles that are in some of the Poe po work, and the very complicated metrical arrangements in Poe's poetry. So uh, Poe was somebody who they uh, accorded a great deal of respect to. The Uli Poe group was a number of people. Uh, George Perec was one of the founders. Uh, George Perec, he wrote, uh, I don't know this, I haven't read this book. He's famous for writing one of the most famous lipograms, in, in literature, and a lipogram was an Olympian structure, and the purpose of Olympians was to create arbitrary structures. Okay, they looked at fiction or literature or art. They wanted to create arbitrary structures. They had no importance. They didn't sit around trying to think of what's the greatest plot. How do I describe the meaning of Western civilization? How do I uh, express love or, or truth? They tried to come up with just games that would force them to write fiction or poetry in a way that it hadn't been written before. Uh, there was a number of ways they did it. The simplest way was with something called the lipogram, which meant you would simply leave out one letter from the English language while you wrote. So the most difficult lipogram to write, of course, would be the anything without the letter E in it. And in French, the letter E is even more difficult to omit than it is in English. And George Perec wrote a book called La Disparu, The Disappearance and the Disappearance of the Letter E. And the lack of the letter E caused him to create sentences and syntactical arrangements of words and to tell his story. It limited what he could do. It forced him to do things in ways he wouldn't have done normally. And he wrote this book, which, uh, which is considered one of the most amazing pieces of prose in French. I haven't read it. I have read passages of the English language translation by Gilbert Adair. I've long argued that this is the greatest act of literary translation in, and probably the most poorly rewarded act of literary translation in the history of, of writing. And he translated La Disparu into English without the letter E, and he called it A Void. It's the perfect uh, English transliteration of La Disparu the void of the letter E, avoid the letter E. So he traded, created this book in English, and it's worth looking at. Um, it has a lot of intellectual and literary energy in it, and I haven't read the whole thing, to be honest with you. So the simplest form of an Olympian structure would be just to omit a letter. There are many others. Anagrams would be considered a literary, uh, arbitrary structure. Um, writing, making sure the first letter of each sentence is the same letter as the last letter of every sentence. That might be an arbitrary structure by which you write your prose. Now, Harry Matthews, and again, I don't know anything about his life really, went to Paris, was involved in Parisian 
intellectual circles. He was long, for a long time, known as the only American member of ULIPO. It's like a weird thing to consider, like your 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 crowning achievement. But he was he he was considered he was the only American who wrote was in ULIPO. He was a very kind of flamboyant um, provocateur. He loved creating structures that were a lot more complicated than leaving out the letter E. There's a book, where is the other one here? Oh, first one I looked at, oh, here it is. Um, he would create algorithms that were so incredibly complicated that, here's, here's one, it's in a book called Ulipo, and he writes an algorithm and he explains how he creates certain syntactical arrangements which change from sentence to sentence and from paragraph to paragraph. They're extremely complicated algorithms, which he created before he started his book. Now, his theory was, and I think it's a sensible theory, is that whatever you, it doesn't matter what sort of structure you start your fiction with. All that matters is that the reader enjoys the fiction. It also matters that once you finish the fiction, whatever structure you've used should just disappear. So it doesn't really matter what structure you started with as long as the fiction that survives is worth reading. And Matthews wrote many books, not a lot of them, but many books. His first one being The Conversions, and his second one being a book called Tluth. And Tluth... <laughs> The joke of the title, Tluth, is it's about losing, some, one of the characters is losing a tooth, and when he talks, he says tooth, he says Tluth, because one of his teeth is missing, but that word has many permutations in the course of the book. Where is it? Tluth, here it is. Okay. So his first two books were The Conversions, The Conversions, and Tluth. And in the course of these early books, they're, they're quite knotty. They're quite over over complicated syntactical structures as far as the sentences go. And I find them to have some passages that are very funny, but you always know you're reading sentences that have been put into some weird device. And even though there's some funny bits in it and funny passages, the overall pleasure of reading these books, I think I gave up on both of them. So I wouldn't recommend reading these first two books. What's worth looking at is that in both of the books, in the first three books particularly, Matthews has his characters wandering through this basically the landscape of words. And the first one, they're escaping a prison camp, and they tell lots of stories in the course of the way. Telling stories is, like for John Barth, telling stories is an important part of the Harry Matthews novel or short story because it's all about storiness. And it's not trying to represent reality -ness. It's just trying to tell us this uh, kind of ridiculous and entertaining story. But in the course of it, he creates these, he, the, the characters discover these different structures and different ways of putting words into the structures. There's one map and a set of words that can go into it in different ways. They, they uncover a puzzle. There's a lot of puzzles, as in Poe. Lots of little structural puzzles. Here's one. He, he spends like 10 or 15 pages on this little puzzle. They find a little button that says uh, reciters. And there's lots of ways you can, you can construct words around this little button and tell different stories. So in the course of this book, we have lots of these little puzzles that are kind of parsed or examined or taken apart or put together. And the books are kind of going different different directions. They're not. I don't. I I wouldn't recommend reading those. The third one I don't have here. The third one is called the Sinking of the Odredek Stadium. There's a huge section of that which is a sort of pig Latin that he creates a language which you can learn to translate into English. It's that kind of jokes. Again, it's different from Barth, in the sense that Barth is taking stories and making us find our way into the story and out of the story in fairly conventional ways. So he has characters, he says plots, the language is, is very rich, and he's making, making uh, he's taking advantage of the availabilities of a language he's got, whereas Matthews is creating 
obstacles for himself as a writer and then overcoming those obstacles the best way he can. So those first three books are the ones that many people know Matthews by and aren't the ones that I like. Uh, I think it's his fourth novel, I'm not sure, fourth novel I reviewed this 30 years ago, 20 years ago in London called Cigarettes. Now one of the things that's important about Matthews is when he creates these algorithms, there's no way a reader can determine what those algorithms are. You really can't. You can tell in the first three books that they're very complicated and that they've led us to read sentences that are so jumpy and twisted and kind of um, uh, kinetic that we don't know how they're, we don't know why they were put together except to fulfill this, these responsibilities. Cigarettes, the prose is much cleaner and the structures of the, of the, there's a few games in the structure of the story, but mainly each chapter is about two different people, particularly in, in New York, as I recall, and the relationships between all these different people, Owen and Phoebe, and Alan and Owen, and Lewis and Morris, and all of their personal and sexual relationships. And it's actually just a really good read. It's very funny. It's very charming. It's about as people you kind of you find in, you will find interesting, and it still has that flavor of being constructed in ways that have forced the writer to make decisions according to the structure he imposed on himself. So I really recommend that one. Um, he wrote another book, which I think I've shown you three times here, My Life in the CIA, which is hilarious. This is one of his late novels, and it's based on the, <laughs> the assumption that he claims at the beginning of the book that he, uh, because he was kind of, I guess he was a fairly well-off guy, I got the feeling, and he was a very secretive sort of person, and many of his friends in Paris thought he was a member of the CIA. By the way, if you'd read the stories about what happened with the Paris Review, <laughs> you might want to check into some of that stuff, because there were stories, of, Ian McEwen writes about it in uh, Sweet Tooth, that there was CIA influence on some of the literary groups in Paris. So there's there's some reality mixed in with fantasy, with 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 self -auto, with autobiography, and with obvious just um, uh, flights of the imagination. And it's a fun book. Uh, what else is there? Um, cigarettes is the one I would really say to go through first. There's a number of other experiments that he conducts over the years, but I I just close on the book that made me decide to talk about him this week, which is The Solitary Twin. I just reviewed this for The Times, and I'll post a link below to my review in The Times. It's fairly brief. But this was, uh, this is a posthumous novel. It's called The Solitary Twin. It's like many Matthews novels, sort of a takeoff on the Decameron. So you have the notion of these two twins in this, this resort, this summer resort. And a number of twin, uh, there, there's uh, they have never met, and then there's a number, there's two other sets of twins, couples who tell stories about their lives, which contain twinning in them. But it's basically like a very small Decameron. So you have several stories, most of which are about the pleasure or perils of telling stories. And at the end, you can feel the same complications in the language that you can feel in the first few books of Matthew. You can tell the structures and the way the paragraphs are written are determined by something that's not simply narrative. But at the same time, he follows through in this notion of twins and develops it. And by the end of the book, you really there's a nice satisfying little twist in this little this little narrative, which you should enjoy. So I, I recommend this is a this is a recent book. It comes out from New Directions, it's very short, and unlike any posthumous novel I can think of, I can only think of Richard Bradigan's An Unfortunate Woman as being a posthumous novel, which actually is worth reading at the, as the first book you read by an author. And it's, it, this is a nice way to meet Harry Matthews, because it's pretty easy to follow, or cigarettes. And I'll post a link to this. In fact, I'm going to post a link to the review they published at the New York Times. And I'm also going to copy in my terrible first draft of that review. And what I tried to do, like an idiot, was to try to write a review of this book without using the letter E. And it's just embarrassing. It's terrible. I didn't know how to do it. But you can sort of see the knots you get yourself tied up in. And when you try to, when you write fiction or write stuff like this, the interesting part is you have no pressure, intellectual pressure in a way. It takes a lot of pressure off you because you're so busy trying to put these little bits and pieces together. It reminded me a lot of writing 
screenplays and, and of revising screenplays, where you're so busy trying to make sure that the character is introduced in the first three minutes rather than in the first ten minutes, that you know, the intellectual and the, the creative and your, your aesthetic concerns just vanish because you're really doing all this technical work. So that was the only pleasure of writing that terrible review, and I'll put that below. Um, I think that's all I had to say about Matthews. A uh, very funny writer. He's got a whole book of, I mean, he's got a whole book of poems about masturbation called Singular Pleasures. I haven't read that one either. Um, but he's definitely a writer worth reading. He's he's also one of those writers I find interesting because you can't really parse him. You can't explain him. You could take, there's no point in taking a course in Harry Matthews because there's a game and you enjoy the results of the game or you don't basically. And I think he would, I would hope he would, I think he would possibly agree with that. And there's no meat point in close reading a Matthews novel because so much of it is arbitrary. There's a great deal of arbitrariness to the way he tells his story. So to spend a lot of time, as some uh, intellectuals do, uh, analyzing each line or sentence or paragraph, is just wasted. Um, at the same time, there is in all of his books, uh, but particularly The Solitary Twin, a writer who's clearly going to fulfill his, his beginning. So he starts the story, and he fulfills that structure, and he completes the structure he starts in the first few pages. And that type of you know, uh, sense of responsibility and pleasure in writing books is much more worth reading and checking out. So I would definitely try him and, and maybe read him a few times. Uh, uh, save the first three books till much later and start with his last three or four books. That's my only advice. Okay, Harry Matthews. Uh, I think in a few days we'll do another writer I find kind of interesting, very different from Harry Matthews. I think we'll, we'll do Robert Aikman. Okay, bye.